So, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to you all here in the room, but also via the live stream to our conference, A Green Recovery for Resilience and Prosperity in a European Ukraine. Um, welcome uh, in particular to the Deputy, uh, Deputy Minister of Economy of the Ukraine, Mr. Solo, uh, Sobolev, and the Deputy Minister of Energy of Ukraine, uh, Roman Anderak, and also to uh, the Deputy Director General, uh, Madame Worsdorfer, and also to uh, Tony Hofreiter, as a, a national MP here from the German Parliament, and uh, of course to all of you that you are here together. We are in a moment where the war is in a critical phase. Uh, one of the main targets of Russian warfare right now is civilian infrastructure. With a terrible motive, Russia wants to create unbearable conditions uh, in Ukraine to make people leave the country and thus also make imperial conquest easier. Without security, all is nothing, and it is our primary task now to enable Ukraine to defend itself and to deter Russia from further aggression. We must do this not only for the sake of Ukraine, but for the security of Europe and a rules-based security order in the world. At the same time, it is not too early to talk about reconstruction and recovery. On the one hand, this is of course a humanitarian need. People just have to survive and cannot wait until the war is over. On the other side, the international commitment to stand with Ukraine and to support reconstruction are an important signal of solidarity both to the Ukrainian people and to the aggressors too. We, we won't give up and there is a future for Ukraine in the European Union no matter what Putin's Russia invents to obstruct integration. Our main task at Heinrich Böll Stiftung, by the way I'm Jan Philipp Albrecht, one of the uh, co-presidents of this uh, foundation, for the um, work also of our Ukrainian team in Kiev and for our effort to strengthen the support for Ukraine from Germany and Europe, our main task here is to contribute to a broad and inclusive public discourse on how to реалізації зеленого, зеленої відбудови, зеленого відновлення. Отже, наш захід тут організовується разом з Дікси Груп українського синктенку. Щиро вдячність пані Олені Павленко, голові Дікси Груп і її команді. І щиро вдячний за те, що сьогоднішня подія стала, ста, стане успішною і за промоцію дискусії про відновлення та відбудову зелене відбудову України. І тепер на початку конференції з відбудови з нашим сайдівентом сьогодні ми хочемо зробити свій внесок у цей процес і також хочу ще раз висловити свою подяку за вашу присутність і передаю слово вам, пані Олена Павленко, за вам слово для вступних вітальних слів. Дякую щиро за увагу. Дякую, дуже дякую, колеги, дуже дякую, друзі. Ми раді вітати вас на сьогоднішньому заході. Ми почали планувати його, як тільки дізналися, що конференція з відбудови України буде відбуватися в Берліні. І, Роберт, я, всі мої колеги, у нас було багато дискусій. І ми думали, як зробити так, щоб наш захід про впровадження національного кліматичного плану і, і плану з енергетики успішним. І до лютого ми все спланували, все розпланували, все було заповнено, але тоді війна внесла свої корективи і через е, атаки Росії на енергоінфраструктуру майже всі українці в Києві, зокрема зараз, вони є без е, електроенергії. Коли я їхала з Києва у моїй квартирі, наприклад, не було у моєму помешканні електрики не було протягом семи годин. Я впевнена, що українці вони є опірні, і звичайно, що ми виживемо, але питання у тому, чи наша економіка зможе вижити.
У нас може бути ситуація, коли усі гроші, усі кошти, які мають йти на декарбонізацію, зелене відновлення, відновлювання джерела енергії і так далі, опиняться в державному бюджеті просто, щоб підтримувати зарплати вчителів, лікарів, військових і просто, щоб покривати негайні потреби. Тому сьогодні ми повинні обговорити цей зв'язок між теперішнім і майбутнім. І ми не повинні забувати це теперішнє. Вплив е, атак на енергосектор України і те, як воно впливає на наші майбутні плани з декарбонізації, це і ті теми також, які ми мали би сьогодні покрити. Як е, допомогти бізнесу врятуватися і пристосуватися до зеленого відновлення, як вижити, е, пережити зиму не втратити, і не втратити мільйони українців, які можуть переїхати в Європейський Союз, а вони нам потрібні в Україні, тому що вони потрібні нам для провадження нашого енергетичного і кліматичного плану. І тому ми поговоримо не тільки про завдання з, з сторони України, але також нашою ціллю зараз є перемогти у війні, але також ми хочемо обговорити підтримку наших партнерів зараз, після війни. І як не залишити, залишитися без людей, без ресурсів, без фондів, щоб, без коштів, щоб... So we are defending now the European values, we are depending now the European future, and for that we need that support every day, but we also need that support to implement our green future um, and, and green recovery. I know that will be a difficult, difficult conversation, but the situation is also difficult now. Whether we can turn crisis into the opportunity depends on our cooperation, and I hope we can discuss such opportunities today. Again, uh, it will not be so easy to connect uh, the destructions and situation in Ukraine now with a green recovery, future decarbonization, but that's a goal which we have to reach together. Thank you very much, and I really wish a very fruitful discussion today. Thank you, and over to Johannes. Yeah, a warm welcome to you here on the stage, a warm welcome to you in the hall and by live stream. Um, my name is Johannes Vosswinkel, I'm the director of the Kiev office of Heinrich Bell Foundation, and I have the pleasure and the honor to be the moderator of the first of two panels. As we know, the Ukraine uh, Recovery Conference casts its shadow ahead. Sometimes it seems to be a large and rather dark shadow, and we want to bring some maybe already some light in it today with two panels with brilliant speakers. I would like to, I won't lose a lot of words because we have a lot of uh, busy people on the panel and I have to say in the beginning, um, we are very glad that they are with us, but some have to leave a bit earlier. And this is not disrespect, of course not. This is the busy schedule with a lot of side events. So we will hurry up to give everybody uh, the possibility to speak out. Um, I would like to introduce in the beginning our speakers. We have with us uh, Mr. Roman Andarak, Deputy Minister of Energy of Ukraine for Digital Development, Digital Transformation and Digitalization. Hello, Mr. Andarak. You will be with us online, of course. Then we have Ms. Mechthild Wörsdorfer. She's Deputy Director General of the DG, General Direction Energy, European Commission. And she has been working for many years in different positions on energy markets and energy policy. Then Mr. Markus Lippold. He is the team lead on energy, environment and green deal in the DG NIR, General Direction European Commission, and has also a lot of professional experience, not only in the commission, but also in the business sphere. Um, then Mr. Sascha Müller-Krenner. He is co-director of Environmental Action Germany, Deutsche Umwelthilfe, for many years an expert on environmental protection, climate and energy policy and international relations. And he was for some years from 98 until 2007 
also a member of the Heinrich Böll Foundation and worked in the offices in Washington and Berlin. Welcome. And last but not least, Anton Hofreiter, member of the Bundestag for the Green Party, chairperson of the Committee on European Union Affairs. He is by profession a biologist, like Mr. Uh, Müller-Krenner, by the way, and one of the most prominent and outspoken supporters of German support for Ukraine in the political sphere in Germany. We don't have such a lot of time. Let's jump into the water right away. Mr. Andarak, um, could you give us, some, let's say, an overview over the current state of things, what concerns the energy system in Ukraine, and give outline some idea what is your strategy to deal with the immense destructions that we have seen, especially in the last months? Thank you, Hannes, uh, your colleagues. It's a great pleasure for me to speak uh, and to address you in, in the company of our very good friends, Markus Mechtelt. We've been working together for many years and uh, uh, also pleasure to speak to, to, to the German audience as Germany is one of the biggest supporters of Ukraine and to the energy sector. Uh, in particular, the biggest contributor to the Energy Support Fund. As you probably know, that the Ukrainian energy sector has been under direct Russian attacks since uh, the very first day of the war. Um, but those attacks, they significantly intensified on uh, in October 2022. Uh, there's a little bit of reduction uh last last uh winter we conducted unprecedented repair campaign we repaired around two gigawatts of generation we passed last winter more or less successfully uh, although attacks uh continued but that wall was destroyed in one day on 22nd of march when russia launched 150 missiles, drones, and uh, mis uh, missiles and drones of different kinds. Some at locations, uh, some facilities were attacked by numerous missiles, six, eight, 10, 12. It basically was not possible to, to, to defend them without a comprehensive and sophisticated air defense system. Uh, those attacks continue, and uh, as from March to 31st of June of this year, uh, we experienced six massive attacks. More, We lost more than 9 gigawatts of power generation in the system. This equals uh, to Latvia and Lithuania combined. This is two times the installed power generation in Slovakia. And I can continue. Ten times the generation of Moldova. Uh, we have made our calculations and we see that the um, deficit in power grid, even if we do all the repairs, will be around two to three gigawatts. We also understand that there is no technology that could be deployed to compensate for the damages. And also we understand that Russians will continue attacking our infrastructure. Just a couple of figures. So we lost 80%, more than 80% of thermal generation, 30% uh, of hydro generation, uh, large few solar power plants were damaged. Uh, Substations of our transmission system operator are under constant and regular tracks. Um, we regularly lose auto transformers, and already this year we lost 21, 15 uh, totally destroyed and six damaged, but hopefully still could be repaired. In terms of power plants, 
uh, eight thermal power plants, four hydropower plants, and three combined heat uh, and uh, electricity and heat power plants. Uh, in this situation, we understand that the government will not be able to cope with this situation alone, that we will need that we need uh, international assistance, but assistance from donors, but also we need to engage with uh, private companies, with individuals, with citizens. Uh, last Friday, the government of Ukraine adopted a program for the compensation of interest rates of uh, renewable installations by private households. We will compensate interest rates for installations of up to 10 kilowatts combined with batteries. We are also thinking about uh, removing, totally removing taxes for, for energy equipment and for reducing, for, for providing support to uh, small, medium enterprises uh, in boosting their own uh, power resilience. Uh, tomorrow, hopefully, we will announce a new Ukrainian green energy transition program uh, under umbrella of which we will combine forces with European Commission Energy Community, IFC, International Renewable Energy Agency, and other partners uh, to support development and uh, deployment of big renewable uh, generation. Uh, we, our focus or uh, or plan consists of several elements. Um, First is indeed um, repairs. Uh, we, can, we will repair as much as possible, uh, but also with that understanding that many facilities could be damaged twice or as many times as Russia will want. Second, we will support, as I said, private generation. Third, is uh, we will uh, work together with the commission and uh, our transmission system operator to enable uh, the uh, increase in electricity import, which is currently limit, uh, limited at 1.7 megawatt. We strongly insist on increasing this limit for to up to two gigawatts. Um, we're also uh, looking for decommissioned power plants in Europe that could be quickly relocated from Europe to Ukraine. And here, Molina probably will hate me because it goes uh, against the national climate plan, but it's a, it's a survival issue. And finally, and it's probably a priority, that's why it's finally, we are looking for all sorts of generations that could be brought into Ukraine fast and deployed by the next winter because the electricity is energy is a big bone of our economy and damaged as as citizens already live for many hours without electricity and experiencing rolling blackouts uh, absence of electricity directly damages our economy. Um, in this regard, I would like to once again thank you for the solidarity, for the support that has been provided to, uh, to, to Ukraine, to our enterprises, to our energy companies. And I also uh, wish you fruitful discussions and creative ideas on how this challenge that we face now could be turned into opportunities. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Andarak. We, we, it's a very difficult situation for you. We wish you all the best. We wish Ukraine, Ukraine all the best. And of course, I have to stress, we as a foundation, for example, um, 
are in favor, of course, of uh, using more and more renewables. But on the other hand, we understand the situation, the difficult situation in which Ukraine is, and that the renewables are a solution for the future, and partly now, but not the only solution to give Ukraine the energy security, which is necessary now. Once again, thanks a lot. Um, and I would like to turn further on to Ms. Wölsdorfer. Um, if you look at the uh, European Commission and the policy of support for the energy system in Ukraine, what are your priorities if you look at short-term and long-term distance? Thank you very much, first of all, of inviting the Commission here. Uh, I would like to thank you both Heinrich Böll Stiftung and Dixie Group. I think in the eve of that very important conference starting tomorrow, um, it's very important to be concrete also on energy. And as we just heard from Roman, and by the way, congratulations for the promotion as Deputy Minister for Energy and Digitalization, I understand. Um, for all what we just heard on the damages, uh, and also recently, I must say we we are experiencing this war and invasion of Russia since two and a half years now, or two years, three months, and we see it getting worse and worse. So I think it's a very timely uh, discussion we are having today on the immediate needs, and I will say a few words, and I will also say a few words on the medium to long term, but I think the emergency, as we heard, is something we can all be helpful all together, Germany, the EU, uh, and others. So I would like to start that the EU is supporting fully the Ukraine. We made a major historic uh, step of uh, inviting or being giving the candidate status to Ukraine in the enlargement. I think this is a clear political signal. We will hear more, but I think that what we want and, and where we are working together so that Ukraine and the future of Ukraine is within the EU and that we make everything possible to support that way and it, it's an absolute priority for us. In order to do so, we just, as I said, we, we heard about the damages and that's why for us the, the imminent priority is to look what we can do and we are fully condemning all these attacks by the Russian side. So we are having a few steps which we are doing right now and I would highlight four. First, it's the in-kind support. So we have a lot of large power generators we are delivering to Ukraine as we speak from our uh, rescue stockpiles to Ukraine state emergency services. And that can power each of them, can power one hospital. So it's definitely not sufficient, but we are focusing on the emergency needs in the hospitals, which are also um, uh, targeted. We also, by 31st of May, we will have over 6,770 power generations and transformers. As um, it was mentioned, this is absolutely needed uh, and we need to protect them because unfortunately sometimes they are attacked again once installed. So that is another worry we are working on it. We have set up a Ukraine support task force, which has been... An I don't think the Energy Community Secretariat is present today, but we are working very, very closely uh, with the Energy Community Secretariat based in Vienna, where we have a task force where we are really looking at these in-kind uh, donations of energy-related equipments from over 100 com companies and over 24 countries. So it's basically an EU-wide effort to, to deliver this in-kind donations uh, as as fa uh, fast as possible. Together with the energy community, uh, we have also set up a specific fund. My commissioner, Katri Simpson, was at the origin. It's Ukraine Support Fund, which is, as we will hear tomorrow, having uh, one, uh, 500 million euros of donations. Germany is one of the biggest one. Other member states are following, and this will channel also, and taking care of all the logistics uh, to deliver uh, all the necessary equipment to Ukraine. And from the EU Commission, a fourth point is the Ukraine facility. It's 50 billion euro. The EU Commission has never given such 
a big amount of money to any of a third country. So the EU and all the, the, the member states, heads of state, have decided on 50 billion euro of Ukraine facility for the next four years. Energy is not only about energy, but energy equipment and energy recovery and green recovery is a big priority here there. And that's why we would also like not only to focus on the emergency need, which we fully understand, but also the next steps and the planning. And I will come back to the national energy and climate plans in that context. One last word which Roman also ma mentioned is the electricity trading because of all the attacks on the power station and infrastructure. We need the neighboring countries to help the Ukraine on the electricity. There are load shedding, so there are few hours per day where there's no electricity planned because there's not enough, but we need to plan it. And that's why we have been working with the TSO, with the transmission system operators and NSOE, the European body in particular. Since two years, there is a full synchronization, which was, I think, a historic jab, uh, step once the war started. And now we have up until 1,700 megawatt, which is the cap, but there's also an emergency uh, instrument if there are hours where there is a need to more imports that can happen. And we are basically in a daily contact with NCE to make a higher step, so to increase this 1,700 megawatts and go higher as uh, uh, Ukraine is asking for. But there is a lot of technical knowledge needed, so not to, to risk any blackouts also on, in any other of the neighboring country. But this is also something in front of the winter. We are in discussion with NSOE to increase that cap and also to speed up winter preparedness. Because as we heard, with all the big help, it's not sure that everything can be repaired. So we need really to be prepared and work with NSOE and the neighboring TSO that the electricity can flow to Ukraine and within Ukraine. So these are all elements of short-term measures uh, in donation, in funds, in electricity trading. And as I said, this all must be linked to a medium to longer term uh, recovery. And we are working also with the Ukrainian government on the national energy and climate plans. You might know that all, it's a, it's all EU member states, Germany as well, has to deliver by the end of June of the national energy and climate plans, meaning how to fulfill the criteria for renewables energy efficiency by 2030. We have high ambitions on renewables, high ambition on energy efficiency, and Ukraine is part of that process. So there is a draft plan on how to deliver also on the climate neutrality by 2050 and the energy efficiency, which is still a, an issue, of course, and the renewables. We are helping and supporting in that difficult time the Ukrainian government and the NECP, like we call it, should come also out in the next month. It's the basis for investments. As we say, despite all the efforts we have now in emergency, we need a green recovery. We need the basis for planning and also for financing and investments and the national energy and climate plans, which we expect to be finalized in the coming weeks or days, is a really planning tool for that to happen. Thank you very much. Thank you. As you have mentioned, the National Energy and Climate Plan, Mr. Lippel, you come from the DG Nier, from the European Commission. If you look at the National Energy and Climate Plan, which has been elaborated in Ukraine, by the way, with the support of our partner today, with Dixie Group, um, for this event. If you look at the plan, what are the, to your opinion, the biggest challenges ahead for Ukraine in putting the plan, plan into reality? Well, the plan's not been uh, presented yet, so um, we're sort of jumping the gun, gun a bit. But in terms of the drafts um, that uh, that we've seen, um, even before the war, one of the challenges was to to really start decarbonizing the country. Um, that was. Um, uh, really um, a big challenge. Now, the tools that you have in terms of achieving that, um, there is the European ETS system that we're using. Uh, you need to set a carbon price. You then come into dis uh, discussions regarding uh, CBAM, so the carbon border adjustment mechanism. Um, so the 
if you will, the elements to really make the decarbonization and building back better strategy stick is what is going to be, I think, the um, the biggest challenge in the NECP. What is great is there there is a plan in terms of how we move forward that is also sort of leading um, in investments. Um, Mechtel already mentioned the, um, the, uh, the facility. The facility, the 50 billion, uh, for those that uh, don't know, is divvied up into three pillars. So the first pillar is predominantly budget support for the Ukrainian government to pay salaries to uh, school teachers, the army, to just have the admin, uh, keep the admin running. So that's about 38 billion. Then there is the so-called pillar two, the Ukraine uh, investment framework, which is around uh, 9 billion together with the international financial institutions, we hope to leverage that up to 40 billion. And this is about de-risking, um, getting private industry in for these uh, huge reconstruction and, and sort of building needs of, of Ukraine. Here, uh, in general, I think we have um, very good um, processes. The way we are engaging with the IFIs, we've uh, partially already managed to shorten uh, processes. The, um, the same is true in terms of all the logistics that we uh, apply and use to get uh, a lot of what um, uh, Mechtel mentioned the EU is doing as aid, but not just the EU, but uh, the G7 plus countries. So via the emergency um, response center and um, the European civil protection mechanism, uh, these are logistics which are not just used by the member states, but also whatever Japan, the US, Canada, and others are, um, are, are donating. So that works well. The, the struggle that we are all having is shortening the timeline of those methodologies, uh, ways of working uh, much, much more, because there is a war going on. And as uh, Roman uh, correctly outlined, the situation has become um, very dire because we started off with an energy system which had a lot of redundancy built in. All of that, and that redundancy is basically what got us or what got Ukraine through the last two winters where you can just take auto transformers, switch gear, um, move stuff within the system where it is um, more efficiently, effectively being used. And that option we don't have anymore. So now it is really about somehow repairing what is still there as capex and getting new generation capacity in. And the, um, the NECP, again, is um, building, if you will, on, on that gives, gives us the, uh, gives industry the perspective in terms of how to invest. Um, what is now much more aligned with um, the plans that the Ukraine has made also in the NECP is looking towards distributed energy production because it is also a matter of energy security. Uh, so Ukraine will go from a very centralized energy system to one that is much more distributed, which sort of nicely fits with renewables, for example. Smaller units, more local, but it is a huge challenge adapting adapting the system. So coming back to your to your question, I think uh, the biggest challenge is really then taking the plan, getting industry to uh, invest. We need good bankable projects going forward uh, that come to also the commission services in terms of pillar two, and we would and we need to see what the best implementing capacities in the country are, because those are also really stretched. So implementing capacity is a real, is a real challenge. Um, so far, I can only say that uh, Ukraine continues to function as it does right now, is already hugely impressive. The 1.7 um, gigawatt in, uh, electricity imports that uh, Ukraine is uh, currently are getting as, as a maximum what we are talking about with NCE in terms of increasing that. It's for me already a very positive uh, message that despite the hits that the Ukrainian energy system has received, they are still able to 
work with those 1.7 uh, gigawatt. So we hopefully get uh, get get uh, get further, and uh, the NECP will be presented uh, on on Wednesday, and then officially we know more. Thank you. Thank you. By the way, there is an agreement. There is an agreement that uh, at least 20% uh, of the investment should be green investment. Just, I don't know if it's possible to give a brief answer, but how should this be best implemented, by your opinion? Well, you know that the Commission uh, has got the taxonomy. Um, there is also a lot embedded in the Green Deal legislation. To get, um, where we work together with the IFIs in Pillar 2, the IFIs also have their... KPIs and, and taxonomy. They are not uh, completely sort of aligned with us yet, but we have, for all the projects we are, which are being put forward, we've got extensive discussions with the IFIs, and uh, in terms of building back um, better, that is one of the focus areas that we have. Also, the like Mechtel said, uh, there is um, the the energy sector is not the only sector sort of for pillar two, but it has become the priority area right now. So it is something that we are we are looking actively and working actively with Ukraine, with the energy community, um, within the different um, DGs at the Commission, and together with the IFIs. Thanks a lot. I have one eye, to be honest, at the clock because you have to to start soon, but we go on. At any rate, thanks a lot for having been here or being here still for several minutes. Um, Mr. Um, Sasha um, Mulakrena, um, in the end, the war of Russia against Ukraine has messed up the energy market in Europe, even beyond all over the world. And did this, in the end, give something like a push to the to decarbonization, to an energy transformation policy which we were waiting for already for a long time. Was there this kind of moment of now this policy has to be not only developed but implemented? Yes, um, to a certain extent it did, and uh, it's a good thing it did, because uh, that was it was not obvious that it would. And uh, as you know, the European Commission had... Uh, this is a huge defining project of the Green Deal, uh, which uh, had this pillar of uh, meeting the climate targets. And um, uh, the, um, another option would have been to, to, to shelve the Green Deal and to say, now we have other problems. But uh, the Commission took the initiative and started, it, as most of you know, the Repower EU program. So basically said the Green Deal provides part of the response we need, uh, make our energy system more resilient, make it more independent from Russia, stabilize energy prices and uh, by the way also meet uh, meet the climate targets uh, so a lot of positive things happened in that context and uh, let me just mention three of, of which i think two are positive and one is more ambiguous and uh, the one was uh, i think uh, for the first time we, just, we should have done that uh, much before uh, there was in a renewed and uh, stronger effort to increase energy efficiency, energy savings. And it's, in fact, I guess that brought us through the last two winters that both industry and consumers, private consumers, saved energy to significant amounts and um, sometimes not voluntarily, but those are sustainable effects partly because uh, some of the investments that were made, changed behavior, will have a lasting effect. That was the one. Um, we've seen a push to, we've seen massive new investments uh, into renewable energies in, in a lot of member states, uh, in, including Germany, and uh, more could have been done, but, uh, but uh, well, at, at the end of the day, I must say, this has given an additional push uh, to that part of the Green Deal. Um, what, uh, uh, what I feel more ambiguous about uh, were all the investments into LNG infrastructure. So, and uh, I'm not really sure whether this is a legacy that uh, will, will help us or make uh, life more complicated in the next years. Because uh, uh, the, the counter argument to the Repower EU approach, basically, well, accelerating the decarbonization of the system 
has been, well, we don't have Russian gas anymore. We need gas from other places, and for that we have to invest in the necessary infrastructure. And that, to a certain extent, I think, was based on, well, certain laziness of thinking, but also of economic interests of large gas consumers that uh, lobbied for that approach, and in my view, led to massive overinvestments in LNG infrastructure, and uh, which you will have to live with uh, for the next years, in particular because all those installations are owned by people who want to make money with it, and this will make uh, decarbonization of um, the economy um, more difficult. Let me just, because we had the European election um, yesterday, um, um, and um, uh, let, let me just also mention as a, a closing thought to respond to your question is, um, I think it was a good idea to look at the Green Deal, not only as a climate change program, but as a program to increase resilience of the system, energy independence, also a modernization of European industry. And I think uh, those who have to make the decisions for the next five years would be well advised to take uh, those factors into account and continue the Green Deal maybe in an adapted manner, but to continue it, not to shelf it. And I think we have a real danger there, and I think that would be a problematic choice, not only for the EU, but also for the EU's neighbors, including uh, countries like Ukraine that are integrating with the EU's energy market in the coming years. If we talk about this process of integration, EU integration, what would be the benefits for the EU of uh, uh, Ukrainian integration into an energy system, benefits what concerns the security of Europe, but also the climate policy. Well, obviously, um, not, now Ukraine having candidate status uh, basically means that step by step, uh, while well, Ukraine will not only have to implement the acquis communautaire of the EU, but also, well, integrate its infrastructure with the EU's infrastructure. This is the hard infrastructure, uh, but this is also the, the, the governance framework in which that develops. This is not only the energy policy framework, but also the, the climate framework. And um, uh, in, in my view, that actually brings a lot of advantages to uh, the uh, European Union, also because of the immense potential for renewables. In, in, in Ukraine, this is this is one, and Ukraine, with its vast uh, land mass, has a huge potential for wind, has huge potential for solar, probably for biomass if it's being done in a sustainable manner. Uh, things that also can be well integrated with a future for the agricultural sector of Ukraine, and we all know integrating the agricultural sector of Ukraine into the common agricultural policy will be one of the more difficult challenges. And, uh, but also one last thought, uh, the e Ukraine is an industrialized country. Ukraine has a lot of heavy industry and if that industry that is partly being destroyed uh, is being rebuilt, I think it would be wise to rebuild it in a decarbonized way. So green steel, for example, replacing uh, what, what we've had before, just as one example. Thank you. Um, Mr. Hofreiter, if, if we look at this kind of uh, benefit that Europe, Germany, Europe could get from the EU integration of uh, also the energy system in, in Ukraine, but you, um, also in the political sense. Um, what would be, to your, uh, to, your, uh, to your opinion, what would be the benefits for Europe of decarbonization and integration of the energy system? And to which extent do we already, do the people in Germany already understand these benefits? That, uh, <clears throat> that are two very different questions. I think the benefits um, would be huge. Um, some already uh, been mentioned. Uh, Ukraine is a very big country uh, which produces or could produce a lot of renewable energy. It has a, a big heavy industry uh, which could uh, be rebuilt in a green way. Um, its agriculture is really efficient and can produce um, food very cheap uh, for people all over the world, also in Europe, so the benefits could be huge. 
I think that people really realize it, that the, uh, these benefits could be huge, are a different thing, uh, because we just had elections in Europe. Um, it's okay, also our fault, uh, because we did not enough to prevent Russian and Chinese propaganda uh, in big countries like uh, uh, France, Italy, and Germany. And so um, the proxies of Putin uh, won elections like Le Pen or AfD. Uh, AfD is not such a big problem uh, than Le Pen. They are more radical and they have uh, not uh, won the elections as similar as uh, uh, fascists in France. Uh, but um, it's still a big problem and we have to deal with it. Um, I think one of the first things we have to realize that all the advantages that we realize in Germany, in France, in Europe, that we are already also be attacked by Russia. Ukraine is openly attacked military. Our societies and our countries are attacked in a hybrid way. And as long as we don't realize it, the attacks will not go away, but we will be not good enough um, to defend ourselves. And to all the things um, which already have been mentioned, uh, to rebuild um, and better build um, the Ukrainian energy system, I only have one, uh, one thing to add. Ukraine needs enough air defense and enough long-range weapons to defend its infrastructure. Because if they don't have enough of them, we can build it 10 times. Russia will not stop to try to destroy it. And so one, I think, very important issue one always has to say when it comes to rebuild infrastructure, there must be enough military infrastructure to defend this infrastructure, because maybe you can rebuild two, three, maybe even four gigawatt, but when it's destroyed again before winter, we have a big problem. And I think the next really important issue is that we in Europe, as in not Ukraine also is Europe, but in the European Union and in Germany, we have to realize that the next winter for Ukraine will be much harsher than the last two winters if we don't do much more. And I think this relation has not hit beside conferences like this. And there we have to do also not only work on the issue itself, but also um, to, yeah, to rise uh, realization in the political sphere. I would like, nevertheless, would like to go into this once again, because how can this be done? Some people uh, say there is some kind of Ukrainian fatigue in parts, at least, of the European Union society. So how break through to the people who, as you said, don't see so far to which extent this is a war against us and to which extent we have um, to support Ukraine also getting benefits from this, by the way, uh, saving our freedom and our democracy? I think one thing which is really important is as much as head of states as possible say it in clear words and not only are just besonnen. Uh, besonnen is, um, I don't know it in English, is always a good thing. Uh, but if uh, besonnen delays decision about half a year, one year, one and a half year. It's not any more besonnen, but it's just don't take decisions. So that I think one of the most important things that people speak clearly what's going on. And not only people like me, normal uh, members of parliament, but also head of states, head of governments. Then the next important issue, as sad as it is, is to say it very clear that millions of people in Ukraine have two options. We help them now, and uh, the energy system will work, or these people will flee their country. And we have again millions of refugees here. 
when there's something which our uh, conservatives and social democrats uh, are scared of is millions of refugees. So um, if you don't want uh, millions of refugees again, we have to do more to help Ukraine. It's a sad thing, but it, people must realize it. And we already, um, it's, I think it's, we were very successful to, to help the refugees from Ukraine and other countries, uh, but the discussion in the society is not the best one. So you have to explain to these politicians, if they don't want millions of refugees more, they have to act now. And then to say very clearly, look, the next winter will be much harsher than the last two winters, because much more is destroyed. I think to speak really clearly and to see what are the trigger points for the people who are hesitant. And sadly enough, millions of refugees is one of the trigger points. Um, maybe to build on the, the point Tony made, I think uh, the leaders of this country, in particularly the Chancellor, have to make clear that when we give money to Ukraine, both for its defense but also for its economy, this is not charity. And it's not a choice, at least not a responsible choice, to say, should we give it to Germans and social security program here or to Ukrainians? It's an investment in our security. It's an investment in the European economy on which we depend. And therefore, this is not a charitable act, but it is something we do in our interest. <laughs> I very much agree of, of what has been said, but from an EU point of view, I mean, the President von der Leyen made it very, very clear that the support and the heads of state and government for Ukraine is there. In a survey within Eurobarometer and the 27 EU member states, obviously you can see some differences. The closer you are geographically, the Baltic states, the Poland or, or Slovakia or others who are closer, are more concerned, but that doesn't mean that others are not concerned. So it's still top on the agenda, and we will see in the next weeks how the new commission will be uh, starting, but I'm quite sure that uh, absolute priority to help uh, Ukraine uh, in that situation will remain top of the agenda. So, And the enlargement process is really a clear political signal because we, I think, all together, are focusing a lot on Ukraine and Moldova in that enlargement process. So I think there are high, but I mean, your question is very much uh, the right one, but I think there, there is a political willingness from all the 27, uh, at least most of the 27, to continue that high support. Yeah, and at least we have some, um, we have some developments which encourage, which give some courage and give some uh, optimism despite of the fact that the situa situation itself is rather dire and difficult, as we said. Thanks a lot for having taken part. This is the first panel of our two panels. We, will, we won't have a break now, just a break to change the panel. And then we will have the second panel with uh, Olena Pavlenko as moderator. Thanks a lot for having been here with us. Thanks a lot, Mr. Andrak. Mm -hmm. Dear speakers, if you can take your seats, please. So we are waiting for our deputy minister who will join us, um, uh, I think just in a few minutes, at least he is running. 
And let me propose to move forward with the agenda. And uh, as soon as the Deputy Minister arrives, we will immediately ask him a lot of questions. Uh, so we have a, uh, a panel which is dedicated on the investments into Ukrainian energy sector. We decided that, of course, despite all the destructions uh, and, and the problems which we have and face now, we still have to discuss how to invest into Ukrainian energy sector, how to build back better, I will repeat this word, and how to ensure that we have uh, interest from the businesses in Ukraine and outside Ukraine to rebuild our country. Um, so we will, again, we will wait for our speaker from the Ministry of Economy to discuss or, or to present what is the government vision on, uh, um, on supporting or involving businesses into the green recovery. Uh, but while we are waiting for, for Alexei, uh, if I may then move uh, with, forward with the agenda and ask our next speaker, who is Andriy Kitura, to, uh, to, join, uh, to join our discussion. So Andriy is a project manager of the Green Transition Office. Green Transition Office um, is supported by the UK government. And this is an office which uh, the goal of the office is actually to help business, to support uh, local businesses and co to cooperate with international financial institutions to ensure that uh, we can do the bankable and good investment projects in Ukraine. Uh, in line with all the European norms, rules, and regulations, um, including in energy sector. So, Andriy, um, my question would be the first to you. Um, what the key priorities in, in what particular subsectors of energy you see as a real good possibility, as a prospective uh, to support in Ukraine, where businesses can come and where you see the real opportunities already now during the war. And maybe if you can elaborate a bit of what is expected, what you think should uh, help businesses to, uh, to start uh, doing some, some new projects already now. Over to you. Thank you, Elena. Hopefully you can see and hear me. Yes. Okay, great. Um, I will start with some general and, um, let's say, more strategic perspectives and then move to the concrete uh, opportunities. Um, Ukraine is a carbon, in carbon and energy intensive country with relatively small economy and also our economy is quite open. When I said open, I mean that the share of uh, import and export is relatively large uh, to the country's GDP. Uh, we border the EU, the largest common market, uh, with the strongest regulations in green transitions uh, field. And we are going to be part of the EU in coming years. So basically, that is the starting point for our green transition uh, pathway. What it gives us? Uh, on the supply side, we have a so-called relatively low base. I mean a quite significant potential for GHG emission reduction. Uh, on the demand side, we are obliged to adopt a very comprehensive uh, legislation, EU legislation in uh, so-called Green Deal. Um, and it will ensure our access to the EU market and green financing. NECP and uh, 20 percentage of Ukraine uh, facility are very good examples here. Uh, so our team in Green Transition Office is currently working on uh, sectoral decarbonization pathways. Our approach is to uh, is a combination of top down and bottom up analysis. Uh, the top uh, the top down analysis will consist on studying available public information, uh, sectoral researches, best available technologies, etc. But also we will use bottom-up analysis and it means that we are going to work very closely with Ukrainian businesses, associations, banks, companies, etc. to verify the assumptions uh, which we uh, obtained during the top-down analysis. Based on our approach, uh, we'll get the so-called marginal abatement curve for GHG emission reductions for Ukraine. And uh, this curve will... Um, Will, will show us three fundamentally different sectors in Ukrainian economy. Uh, there will be cases where um, the cost of GHG emission reductions 
in Ukraine is negative. It means that the projects are profitable by default and uh, like uh, GHG emission reduction is an uh, um, additional positive externality. Uh, since those cases are still in Ukraine, it means that there is kind of legislative and administrative obstacles and our government, like one of the key tasks for our government would be to, to solve this, to remove these obstacles. Like very good example of such uh, administrative obstacle is a ban on biomethan export from Ukraine. And yeah, a few, few months ago, we, we more or less solved it. The, the second sector, um, I, I, I usually call it like a field of play for AFIs. I will explain. Like Ukraine, Ukraine currently has no emission trading scheme and the carbon tax is relatively low in Ukraine. It's lower than one euro. Um, like the, the, la the launch of emission trading scheme, as well as liberalization of energy market prices, uh, will uh, like uh, bring this second sector for, 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 for Ukraine. I mean that the, some, uh, some projects uh, will become financially attractive at a certain level of uh, carbon prices. So far, uh, they are not uh, attractive for, for the investors. Uh, and, the, and the third uh, sector uh, contains the projects which, that are not feasible at current level of technologies and prices. It means that we should postpone such kind of investments and uh, like uh, uh, we should not waste limited resources of Ukrainian economy and potential additional resources from, from abroad. Like a good example of such, uh, such uh, so far, uh, not feasible projects are investment in carbon capture and storage in Ukraine. Probably it would be feasible, but maybe in 10 or 15 years. Okay, uh, let's move to like more specific opportunities. Our team together with uh, the Ministry of Economy and uh, Kyiv School of Economy uh, has been working on database of investment projects. Uh, tomorrow during the URC, uh, the investment guide will be uh, presented by the ministry representatives. Uh, this guide uh, covers key sectors of Ukrainian economy, as well as information uh, about uh, more than 100 investment projects uh, which Ukraine uh, can offer to the investors. Um, our team analyzed uh, these projects and we identified those of them who, uh, which, uh, which means the EU green taxonomy criteria, as well as criteria of uh, different IFIs. So in total, we identified uh, 37, let's say, green projects. Uh, I will not pick uh, specific projects right now, also uh, because you, you will you'll be able to find all necessary information tomorrow. Uh, after the presentation of guide of the guide, also to be honest, I'm not going to to uh, to speak uh, in details about energy sector. Uh, nevertheless, Olena asked about that uh, because um, we have already talked about it a lot, and uh, many speakers before before me also mentioned it, uh, like the urgent needs uh, and more or less the, the, the investments uh, opportunities in the energy sector is clear. It's, uh, it's, related to renewable energy and distributed generation. So, but I want to highlight three other quite important and interesting sectors for investment in green transition in Ukraine. I will start with green steel. Like uh, steel making globally is one of the most carbon intensive sector. And uh, like uh, the sector uh, has a huge uh, potential for GHG emission reduction, Te technological, uh, fin financially feasible. Uh, Green steel production uh, probably will uh, grow dramatically during the next decades, and the EU uh, probably would be one of the key market. And Ukraine is keen to be an important player on this market, uh, and we have uh, all needed precondition for that. Namely, uh, we have really uh, very very good iron ore resources base and uh, large potential for renewable energy production. Also, I want to emphasize that Ukraine can replace Russian steel on the EU market. Um, our steel uh, is already less carbon intensive. And, and as, as I said, uh, also with uh, the implementation of CBAM and uh, launching Ukrainian trading system, 
the investments in green steel in Ukraine would be not only feasible, but quite attractive for, 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 for the investors. Uh, the second uh, important sector is critical materials. Um, the EU is building a new critical materials strategy um, and it would be like a very important part of sustainable economic, economic growth for the Union and uh, it also will be a kind of solution for energy security. Uh, this is a guarantee of uh, steady demand for critical materials and uh, the availability of some of critical materials in Ukraine as well as uh, quite convenient uh, logistics uh, is a kind of competitive advantage uh, for, for the investors to, uh, to, to, to extraction and pr processing of critical materials in Ukraine. And this, uh, this the last but not least, uh, I want to mention the large potential for investments in bioenergy and biomethane production in Ukraine. Um, the EU has planned to, to boost the biomethane production to 35 uh, billion of uh, cubic meters till 2030. Ukraine could be part of this solution. Uh, so far, we have uh, uh, three biomethan productions in Ukraine, and uh, SETI is ready to, to be uh, launched. Um, our potential till 2030 is 1 billion of uh, uh, cubic meters, and in long term, we could produce more than uh, 20 billion. Um, well, uh, just to sum up, uh, to summarize, and for the uh, about next steps, yeah, uh, life uh, does not end after the URC. We will continue work further with uh, database of investment projects. Uh, in particular, so far we collect information about six hundred of different projects. Uh, we, uh, together with the Ministry and the Kiev School of Economy, we are going to screen each of them. We are going to uh, update the information uh, and add, if possible, the additional projects. Uh, the results of our analysis will be available online on the resources of the Ministry of Economy. Uh, so it will be an ongoing process. Also, on Wednesday, uh, there will be a separate panel uh, dedicated to the NCP. Uh, in particular, in ECP implementation, where uh, government representatives will talk about uh, roadshow. Road uh, we plan to do as a part of NCP implementation. Like the green projects uh, would be part of this uh, roadshow as well. So thank you for your, for, for your attention. Hopefully to see you uh, online and offline. Uh, thank you. Or during roadshow <laughs> in European cities. Thank you, Andrei. So, um, actually, green steel, critical raw materials, and uh, biomass, biogas, biomethane also are connected to uh, energy sector because for green steel you need renewables. For critical raw materials actually um, is something which is also needed to produce a lot of um, equipment for renewables, and the biomethane actually is also part of the of the energy sector. So, uh, let me pass the floor to our next speaker, to Natalia Petruchenko. Oh, sorry, Nadia Petruchenko, who is co-founder and chief business officer of SPP Development Ukraine from UN Global Compact Network. And just to um, follow up uh, what Andrei was saying, how to make and what should be done to speed up all the uh, investments opportunities in Ukraine, in the sectors which Andrei mentioned, but also in others. Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon, dear all. Uh, my name is Nadia Petruchenko. I'm the chief business officer of SPP Development Ukraine. Our company working in Ukraine uninterrupted work we have during the war period, and we successfully implement numbers renewables projects before the war. And we are proud that we are continuing our work all full cycle invasion and right now. We have three divisions from our company. It's development, we develop wind, solar and battery storage project. It's construction and maintenance and services. And let's speak about the development since this is the main task about new facilities in Ukraine. First of all, we as a company which focus in every day with some numbers of issues related to the project's implementation, we see some um, 
difficult, which call, call it unflexible. So let's start from the financial institution. Most of the financial institution still keep the same requirements to Ukrainian facility as it was before the war, as it in all countries. And they told us, this is our standards. Yes, it is. But we are living on not standard conditions. We have the war. And we are not able to correspond to that conditions right now. Next, it's about the suppliers. Suppliers usually provide for us numbers, offerings. Because for them, Ukraine currently is the biggest, largest market. Yes, it's happened. We really need numbers of energy equipment right now. But simultaneously, they are not flexible to provide for Ukrainian new facility special flexible condition like post payment, milestone payment, not front payment, something like that. And this is the issue next. Regarding the potential investor, typically they start to learn in the market at home. Rules, requirements, permits, details, etc. Just today, I was participants on the business lunch where our Ministry of Energy uh, also took a place, and he said absolutely right words. He said, "Let's investor select the project right now and learn the market simultaneously with roadmap of the implementation of the project simultaneously." So. If you are really would like to enter to Ukrainian market, you should to select project now. Because typically what we see is that all investors, they spend like one, two years to learn the market and details, and only after that ready to uh, learn, uh, to identify the project. We consider it should be simultaneously. So the issue which we urge of the interesting people from the market, it's to be more flexible do it to the special challenges and conditions wherever we are working right now. And I would like to finish with a small example. Our company started building a new facility um, two months ago. We didn't receive insurance. We didn't receive special conditions for the equipment. We didn't receive any support, grant, something like that, because it's taking a lot of time. But we need this generation now, not after two years. That's why it's only our responsibility to start to build in this facility right now. And if we would like to increase the generation facility and to support Ukrainian energy system from the battery storage, it's most biggest demand right now, from the uh, generation distributed facilities, we need that all stakeholders change their approach and the way. And we hope that after such conference, after such events, something will be changed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nadia. And now uh, let me pass the floor to our next speaker, Olga Kovalchuk, Head of Finance and Investment, Goldberg Solar, Germany. Um, if I know correctly, please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, uh, your company is considering to invest in Ukraine even now, despite the war. Um, and again, why? And uh, what do you expect from Ukrainian government? What do you expect from, from Ukraine? Uh, in terms of, uh, of supporting your initiatives, your investments? And uh, what would you say to other businesses who would like to also come to Ukraine right now? Hello, everybody, and uh, thanks. Uh, great pleasure to be in touch. Thanks for, for inviting us and having us here. Um, maybe two, three words to the company. Um, I represent Goldbeck Solar. Uh, for those who do not know us, it's a, it's a German business, so it's a Germany family-owned company, which has been in the market for 23 years by now. In the span of that time, we have built uh, more than three gigas uh, of solar assets across 20 countries. And we are having right now an operation of maintenance portfolio of 1.5 gigas of our own assets, but also providing those services for the third parties. And we are owning roughly 440 megawatt on our own books. Largest chunk of that is uh, the largest solar plant in, uh, in Poland. 204 of that plant is operational since autumn 22 and the plant will reach the final capacity of 290 later this, the beginning of next year. 
We are the largest IPP in Kazakhstan, owning 176 MVs of operational solar plants, and uh, one smaller plant in Canada and two plants in Chile. So we cover the full value chain of the realization cycle of the solar assets, so starting from project development, structuring the finance, providing EPC, O&M, and then ultimately asset management services. Uh, last year, we have taken decision to enter the Ukrainian market. Uh, we have done that consciously uh, with a goal to realize up till 500 MVs in the next three to five years in the country. Of course, we are very conscious of that decision and uh, unlike uh, the other countries, so those investments are very uh, money intense and actually the core decision or the core reason for that decision last year was that we are able uh, to apply to the investor insurance from the German government, which we are eligible to, being a German, in, a German investor and the sponsor. That insurance covers, among others, war risks. And this is, for us, one of the key factors that we are considering for each single project. And this is basically dictating also the regions uh, of the project that we are looking into. So speaking broadly, we're looking into Western and central regions of the country. So since that decision has, has been taken, we have already conducted a number of different steps. So we have entered into, uh, into several agreements with the local partners, so securing the access to that portfolio. We have structured the, the finance, and I think this is not a surprise um, to, to none of you, but in these conditions, uh, mostly uh, DFI are the parties who are available uh, to provide uh, the structured finance. However, we, ha we also we having the first uh, discussions with the commercial lenders, which are, is, is in a very positive sign for uh, liberalization of the market and providing, of course, a different commercial terms and conditions because the, the financing and the cost of that financing for those, uh, for those projects is the key. The second point, and I think this is really the core challenge right now as we speak, is the, uh, the long-term uh, project offtake. Uh, right now, uh, the challenge in the market is that the, uh, the amount of the bankable PPA of takers who are ready to structure long-term corporate PPAs is very limited. So for, for us, is one of the key elements so to unblocking the markets and to realize the next projects to come which are so badly needed for the, for the market. So this is really the, the core of the attention that we are working as, uh, with the government on the different uh, levels. Uh, what I want also to reiterate, I think on the positive side, is uh, in general the, uh, the Ukrainian government has been really immensely supporting to us in all the different aspects. So among others, once we started, for example, working on the corporate PPAs, the changes went to, were introduced to allow the structuring of those PPAs. I think the second positive element would be the easement of... Um, of distribution of, of the dividends and the foreign exchange provisions which were uh, implemented by the National Bank of Ukraine recently, which were also really needed and, uh, and important from the foreign investor perspective. So all in all, I would say that uh, yes, it's, it's a very challenging environment, it's a very challenging market, but we are there and we are ready to, uh, to structure the deals right now. So we have done it so successfully in a number of different countries. So happy to have a separate conversation and uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And last but not the least uh, is uh, Olana Baida, our um, uh, international, sorry, independent energy expert. Uh, Olana was part of the team who drafted National Energy and Climate Plan. Uh, Olana, uh, so we heard already about uh, the companies who are ready to invest, who are investing, who develop their plans, 
who will have some support, also capacity support from the government. But it's also uh, the, the doing business in Ukraine also demands a huge cooperation with the local communities, with other stakeholders. Um, how do you think uh, and what uh, we can ask from the local level, from the municipalities, from other stakeholders, in order to ensure that we will have the investments in green recovery? Thank you. Good afternoon, dear colleagues, and thank you for the opportunity to take part in today's event. Um, as a member of the drafting team of NCP, I can tell you that the national plan envisages that the government will adopt the roadmap on building a decentralized energy system, and this roadmap shall be adopted within three months after the adoption of the National Energy and Climate Plan. However, this, we see that uh, being able to plan, and more importantly, living according to this plan, is a privilege we took for granted, but we do not have any more. And this decentralized energy system is emerging now, before waiting of this uh, comprehensive document, out of necessity to prevent a humanitarian catastrophe. So the efforts of the government are focused basically on ensuring building new gas fueled capacities, uh, which will uh, substitute the damaged maneuverable capacities. And this is done in a quite centralized way with the help of uh, IFIs, with the help of uh, state-owned enterprises, uh, due, to the, due to the reasons of the need to act rapidly and no, uh, well, it's basically no time to build capacity and to loan. However, when we talk about uh, building a decentralized energy system, it cannot be achieved in a centralized way. And here, an important role is also of the local governments and civil society. Uh, we have already discussed the uh, industrial scale re renewables installations. And I will suggest talking also about the small-scale uh, solar uh, combined with uh, uh, electricity storage. Uh, these type of projects, they cannot substitute those nine gigawatts of the damaged capacities which Ukraine lost. At the same time, uh, these kind of uh, projects provide multiple benefits for the local communities and this could be implemented rapidly. When we talk about the small-scale solar, there are uh, multiple benefits you are all well aware. For example, the, the uh, price of the um, technology is lower comparing to other renewable technologies. But I also uh, would suggest talking about additional benefits from the perspective of the local uh, communities and perspective of participation of the civil society. First of all, these type of projects, they provide an opportunity for learning by doing. Uh, local communities are uh, lacking experience in implementing these kind of projects. Uh, they are lacking experience in uh, um, finding finance and going through the old stages of, of project implementation. Uh, implementing small-scale solar is rather a uh, simplified process, specifically when we talk about uh, installing uh, power plants, uh, for example, on the facilities like schools or kindergartens. In these cases, communities do not need to find no uh, land plots, they do not need to increase the uh, connected capacity, and they also do not need to go through the uh, hard uh, environmental um, procedures. Uh, secondly, this type of projects, uh, they uh, build trust between the uh, local communities and civil societies. Uh, one uh, illustration of, of this type of projects is the program uh, which was launched by German government and called Renewables for Resilient Ukraine. Under this program, 16 Ukrainian communities received grants to implement uh, small-scale solar stations. And basically, these communities were backed by civil society. Uh, Non-governmental organizations helped their municipalities to draft and develop the project documentation, to design the projects, and to go through all stages of building these power plants. 
and this uh, makes uh, changes the dynamics of the uh, relations between uh, the local self governments and civil society. Basically, they do not uh, perceive each other as opponents or uh, just uh, uh, partners who can uh, discuss some kind of uh, legislation or uh, decisions of local self government. Now they become real partners who work shoulder to shoulder together. And uh, another benefit of this kind of projects, basically they create hope for the uh, Ukrainian people. As the Russian missiles, they do target not only uh, the energy infrastructure, they target the minds of Ukrainians. And uh, small-scale projects, they do not provide uh, all the needed demand, but they are very visible and they are very understandable. And when people see that the solar, new solar stations are installed on the kindergartens, on schools, on hospitals, they understand that their children will uh, receive education. They understand that the, their elderly will receive medical services. And this is one of the reasons why they will take the decision to stay in Ukraine and continue our efforts um, in this war. So all in all, uh, I would say that there are uh, different needs taken into account the harsh circumstances of Ukraine. Of course, the priority uh, of the government and priority of the whole country is substituting the large-scale uh, damages and we need new uh, large-scale installations. At the same time, uh, I would encourage you not to oversee the smaller kind of projects where local communities and civil societies will be engaged uh, with a small caveat. Uh, we do have a small pool of uh, Ukrainian municipalities who are very advanced, very experienced, and I would call them the energy uh, champions. At the same time, we need a vast number of communities who are able to implement uh, this kind of projects and they need to build their capacities just to build a new decentralized and resilient energy system. Thank you. Thank you. So we didn't have a chance to ask questions at the first panel, but maybe we'll try to do this at the second panel. If you have any questions, please raise your hand. Um, I do have mine, but if you have if you would like to ask some questions, okay, then I, I will, oh, please go ahead. Uh, first and the second one. Yeah, my name is Tobias Munchmeier. I'm a representative of Greenpeace. Um, very interesting, two discussions actually. Um, uh, I would like to um, support very much what um, uh, Mrs. Beider just said uh, about yeah, about the need to go uh, for for the large capacities and for the small capacities um, uh, at the same time, um, so we don't have the luxury actually to go for one strategy. But but in this emergency situation, uh, everything is uh, uh, must be implemented on a on a um, yeah high speed actually. Uh, I just would like to present for one second. Uh, Greenpeace has published yesterday the Solar Marshall Plan for Ukraine. Um, that is a document uh, which has been worked out by Berlin Economics here in Berlin, uh, and which shows that uh, in, the in the next uh, three years, up to 3.6 um, gigawatt could be installed, um, uh, cost optimal. Um, and this is five times more than um, in the Ukraine plan the Ukraine government has uh, proposed for this uh, period. And here comes my question. So uh, I, we have also been asked to comment on the NECP for, of Ukraine, and we saw the yeah, very unambitious figures for the um, uh, increase of renewable energies going wind and solar uh, combined uh, from 2024% to 2030-10%. Uh, um, uh, there's also the figure in the Ukraine plan plan saying uh, only 0 0.7 gigawatt technical potential could be added in the next three years. Um, uh, and uh, we see that in some of the ministries, um, yeah, let's be very frank, in the Ministry of Energy, 
the interest of the large of the centralized system is very much um, represented. And my question would be uh, to you, where do you see, let's say, thinking, modern thinking, and once thinking in the Ukrainian government? Do you see it among um, representatives of the uh, presidential administration? Do you see it more uh, among the Ministry of Economy? Um, are there other, other ministries playing a large role? Uh, so I would be very interested what you see as um, champions on the national level, since I totally agree on the regional level, we have many champions, many mayors who are now also yet tomorrow will represent their cities. Uh, there's a lot of hope, but in the central government, uh, there's a big question mark from, from us. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe I'll ask, oh, let's, let's take the, the second question and then uh, we'll start uh, asking for answers. Thank you. My name is Winfried Damm and I'm working for GIZ for Ukraine in the field of district heating. And there's my question on this. Uh, can you comment on the situation of district heating right now? And I'm afraid that it absorbs about 40% of the energy demand in Ukraine. And with the current situation of destroying um, the main power plants there, I'm really afraid that we feel that we get a lot of apartments not being able to be heated this winter. So what would you do? You escape to Western Europe. And how many people would you believe are moving to Western Europe because of the winter issues? And what can be done till winter to prevent this? Thank you. Thank you very much. Maybe I'll start. Uh, I, I'll ask uh, Olena because she was a co-author of the National Energy and Climate Plan to comment on these uh, targets on renewables in NACP. Um, I will I will add a, a little bit also on the heating and NACP, and then we'll ask also colleagues, uh, also online, Andri, to answer questions uh, if they would like to step in. Olanka. Uh, starting talking about the uh, renewables targets, uh, when we, uh, when our modeling team analyzes the possibilities to install more solar or install more other types of renewables capacities, uh, they uh, needed to take into account the uh, availability of maneuverable capacities, which could counterbalance the intermittent re renewables. And the Ukrainian system, even before these uh, huge attacks, uh, before the March of this year, was highly inflexible. And the modeling team took into account the uh, forecasts of our TSO, or Clarenergo. So basically, that envisaged the possibility of the system to absorb the intermittent uh, renewable energy sources. Uh, now the situation is different and the situation is much, much worse because uh, the attacks which started in the end of March were targeted mostly uh, the maneuverable uh, capacities. And now we mostly rely on nuclear renewables already installed and imports from the EU. And until we install new maneuverable capacities, I do not think it will be possible, technically possible, to increase the target significantly. Um, if talking about uh, district heating, uh, we have a few instances where the attacks targeted the combined heat and electricity power stations, Kharkiv, Burstin, where the population relied on this power station both on electricity and heat. And in these particular cases, the government uh, organized separate working group which basically uh, target donors, target IFIs uh, to uh, collect the um, new equipment and to uh, install smaller scale installation in these particular cities. Um, and in the longer run, of course, the heating sector should be transformed to be able to attract investments for uh, new generating capacities without the request to donors to provide the equipment. And here the key issue is that we still did not um, transform our tariff system. Uh, the uh, tariffs for heating are currently uh, freezed. There is a moratorium on increasing tariffs. And the difference between the economical, uh, basically, of, of the economical 
economically based tariffs and the tariffs we actually have should be compensated uh, by the government to the heat generating companies. And this is not being done. This is the uh, key problem of our heat sector, their financial um, unhealthy situation. And this is the uh, first step to, to, for, for the reform, uh, which are also envisaged in the National Energy and Climate Plan. Maybe I'll just add on the, on the heating. Uh, you are correct, actually, it's globally when the heating and cooling gets 50% uh, of energy consumption, right? And so Ukraine also, it's not an uh, exemption here. But, um, regarding the solution, according to National Energy and Climate Plan, Ukraine should have if I'm not mistaken, 40% of decarbonized heating by 2035. It's a huge, <laughs> and, and unlike renewables, it's a huge target for us. And uh, it's also a huge opportunity, I think. And we have to look for um, all possible solutions. We just uh, recently in May, we discussed possibility to use geothermal energy for heating and cooling in uh, cities. And I have to say that Germany could be a good example. So we know that you have a lot of, uh, a lot of projects uh, using geothermal energy for heating and cooling. Um, welcome, uh, welcome with such projects to Ukraine as a GIZ and maybe as other uh, donors. Uh, and maybe I'll pass the floor to colleagues who would like to comment. Uh, uh, Andri, uh, Nadia, Andri, would you like to take a comment? No. Okay, Nadia. Okay. Thank you so much. I would like to add something. First of all, regarding the government structure, just uh, we also have except ministry, we have National Energy Commission, and the, today. Uh, we had one of the numbers public discussion. They are working hard to adopt the law and to speeding up the procedure for investing in Ukrainian market, especially the demand like battery storage. They created in, uh, investment intensives in order to start the construction right now. And regarding the community, it's most welcoming in Ukraine to build the donation facility in the community where it serves. It's small project skill depend on the capacity which needed on this local community. So we consider that it's a really good way in Ukraine and well, welcome approach. Regarding the lack of electricity, this is the reality in Ukraine. And what we are doing um, in order to turn our work into tangible reality, realities, for instance, we are working with uh, our company, we are working with numbers of financial institutions in order to create a special program uh, for the um, householders and for the small industry that provide for them some special loan and they will be able to build uh, any um, storage or generated facility and have a chance to pass that winter. So uh, in Ukraine, for sure, we know and we feel what we need to do right now in our uh, current situation. And we consider that with some support from stakeholders, for sure, we can pass the challenges as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Olga. Um, yeah, I think I would address the question, your question around the, uh, the work uh, with the government. So first of all, um, our CEO is, uh, is the president of the German Solar Association, which, uh, where we are very active and working uh, on a number of different uh, initiatives and channels, where we, uh, we, we are piloting uh, different changes uh, to be introduced within also the Ukrainian uh, regulations. On the Ukrainian side, our major counterparty uh, remains the, the Ministry of Energy, uh, with whom we are working closely also on, uh, on the number of, um, of initiatives. So, in fact, uh, yeah, there will be some news tomorrow uh, at, uh, at URC, so do not want to preempt that. Um, and uh, these are the, the major channels on the, uh, on the governmental level. Uh, nevertheless, we are also, or in addition to that, we are also uh, members of uh, a number of uh, different associations, uh, the international ones, but also in Ukraine, where companies like ours um, are part of the uh, energy working groups, 
uh, and we are trying to tackle all those uh, issues, so enabling and uh, pivoting are the challenges right now in the market. So it's basically like a two layers approach from the governmental, but also um, through the uh, through the associations. Thanks. Um, are there any other questions? Please here and then uh, back on the row. Thank you. Uh, my name is Julia in Joyka Club from Ukraine. Uh, you know that right now Ukrainian government declares the plans to invest in nuclear energy, especially to build new nuclear units. Uh, so my question is for the investors. Uh, do these plans encourage you to still invest in sustainable projects in Ukraine and especially cooperate with uh, Ukrainian government structures? Thank you. Thank you. And another question on the back. Thank you. Hello to everyone. My name is Natalia Rebutska. I'm coordinator of Women's Club of Ukraine. Uh, I want to say it's a big pleasure to see so many beautiful women and very clever, very, very uh, professional women uh, of, from energy. And my question is, uh, how do you think and what do you think about the situation with workforce in Ukraine in energy sphere, especially? And uh, what do you think, what is the role of women and which it could be in uh, participating in such project in solar and in renewables. Thank you. Thank you. We have a good gender composition here today. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so maybe the first question goes to Olga and then uh, probably to Olena and uh, Nadia also, as you would if you, yes. Maybe um, I would address both questions. So starting with the last one. Uh, and I, yeah, I do appreciate so that this panel is indeed a, a, a strong female presentation, which is normally not the case. So happy to be, to be a part of this uh, great panel of the professionals. Um, first of all, what I wanted to mention is, uh, for instance, I mentioned earlier the our Kazakh projects. Um, in that project, we have implemented um, a program with the Kazakh government uh, where we have introduced uh, within, the, within the universities actually an engineering profession for the renewables specifically for women. So we are actively promoting uh, and uh, the uh, first of all providing the the uh, the employment opportunities for women, not only and apologies for getting the stereotypes like in the classical uh, jobs, but also working uh, in, uh, in the spheres which are r rather normally male dominant. A part of the structure in the finance for our future deals, and this is what I can tell you already, uh, will be also uh, an initiative uh, around the incorporation of a certain percentage uh, of women, but also uh, the, uh, the, the people who are returning from, from the front lines, who are returning from, from the war and uh, giving them the possibility, uh, first of all, to give, uh, to give them the job, but also be a part uh, of the renewable energy sector and the renewable energy integration. So that is kind of already all those um, initiatives we are discussing now. So uh, there will be uh, more and we will be working more on, uh, on the next months to come. So hopefully uh, when we see each other in one year, there will be more, more concrete on that end. Um, in terms of your question on the uh, on the nuclear, um, we are, we are looking into into this topic. So for us, uh, we are moving. So our our strategy remains uh, the same. So we uh, our focus and the focus uh, of the company is uh, is to work uh, within the solar. So we do uh, we do see uh, we do see the uh, the future of Ukraine. We see great chances of renewables being integrated within the the energy mix. Uh, of course, needs to be seen how, uh, yeah, how the next steps uh, would look like. But from our perspective, our uh, our steps uh, d remain unchanged. Alana. Yeah, coming back to to the um, uh, question about the uh, human capital. Um, we are currently in a situation where we cannot divide professions into male and female. 
and uh, in the national and climate energy and climate plan we uh, uh, we uh, acknowledge this risk that we do not have enough human capital and this is a big challenge for our business and big ch challenge for our, for the government and here of course the role of uh, female uh, engineers and other kind of professionals of course grows uh, because another part of the problem with uh, human capital and rebuilding the energy system is actually the fact that international com companies are cautious with going into Ukraine in, under uh, current circumstances. And Ukrainian male professionals cannot leave Ukraine uh, easily to go for trainings to build their capacities. This is why, of course, uh, women participation is well, is really needed. And I know that Women Energy Club has already experience in, in training women and in, in kind of providing trainings for uh, changing the profession or increasing the knowledge. Thank you for this initiative. Thank you. Um, Nadia? I would like to say that I totally agree with Olena. Uh, we are not dividing to female and male right now, but from another side, I would like to say that from our company we have more women, and no one from them left Ukraine. All of them stay in our country and continue their work, and this is their women power, for sure. Thanks a lot. Um, the final round of the questions, Ivra, please one question here and one question there. Hi, uh, my name is Cheryl White. I work with Green Deal Ukraine and also uh, with Dixie Group because it's a part of the project. Um, my question was regarding the short-term or no-regret investments which you talked about. You mentioned green steel and you also mentioned a lot of critical materials. Um, from my understanding, a lot of that is currently has been destroyed. As of Slava, we see a very, very large plant for steel production, and a lot of the critical materials are in currently occupied territories, and we don't know what that um, perspective will be like in the next year, for instance. So when you say no regret investments, what is the timeline that you're looking at, and how do you see that moving forward? Maybe just a little bit of comments. Thank you, and there was a question. Yes, hi there, uh, Lennart Klerk. Uh, we've um, calculated the uh, the emissions that uh, the emissions of greenhouse gases that this uh, war has uh, caused, and one of our, one of our main findings was that a third of the emissions of the war will be in the future reconstruction, because we will need an awful lot of cement and uh, and steel. Um, however, there are also alternative uh, construction materials, like for example hemp, hempcrete or using a wood structure um, that would only not have the benefit of avoiding emissions, but they are also carbon sinks, so they actually take CO2 out of the, uh, the atmosphere. And my question was, because you've been talking about energy um, and steel, but have you also looked into this aspect of the reconstruction, how to avoid and how to decarbonize the construction sector? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think uh, those questions should go to Andri, so you have no chance to just keep silence. And then if others, colleagues would like to respond, uh, uh, most of them welcome. Andri, over to you. I would like to ask you to be very short. We have only seven minutes left. Okay, I will try. Thank you. Um, I believe the key question, the key part of first question was about what is the timeline? Uh, and we are considering next year, this year, this month, if possible. I'm serious. I mean, uh, when we are speaking about uh, even about green steel in Ukraine, uh, it it could be uh, we, we could have two options. First option is to modernize existing capacity. We have in, we still have in Ukraine quite large uh, iron and steel industry, and. Uh, Almost all facility could be modernized uh, or we can build based on the existing capacity. We could build a DRI uh, or a, a, a other, let's say, green steel uh, technologies. Uh, the second option is to build a brand new production. Uh, we also have in Ukraine, uh, we still have uh, very significant deposits of iron ore. Um, 
So and it, it could be based for new uh, brand new iron and steel production in Ukraine. So uh, it's not the question about, about the uh, okay, no, no, okay. For, war, for sure war significantly impacted our capacity and our uh, availability of resources for Ukraine, especially for financing for Ukraine. So there's a bottleneck is. Uh, uh, war risks and uh, available uh, financing. Uh, if we could manage it, uh, and for both uh, both reasons, we need here IFIs, we need international uh, partners, etc. Uh, we would be successful in this uh, particular uh, sphere. Regarding the critical materials, uh, we we have uh, yeah, unfortunately, some part of our deposits now is occupied by Russia. But nevertheless, we have quite significant deposits of different critical materials on the territory via, which is under our control and hopefully will be under our control as well. So uh, some of them are, uh, are in the western part of Ukraine and in terms of uh, physical risks are more or less safe, I believe. Uh, second question was uh, uh, the second uh, question was about the emissions from reconstruction. Um, yeah, we are considering, the, for example, the salmon production. Uh, we started. We have already started the analysis of uh, sectoral pathway in salmon industry. So uh, yeah, it would be one of our focus. Uh, we, we do understand the importance for Ukraine. Uh, we do realize a huge need in new construction materials uh, in uh, to rebuild uh, uh, Ukraine. Uh, that's why, like decarboniz decarbonization of this sphere, would be very crucial for, for, for Ukraine. Thank you. Um, I promise this will be the last question from my side to the speakers, and I would like to ask to, uh, your to answer with only one word. Um, from your perspective, uh, the destruction which we have now, uh, what it will bring in terms of green recovery? More challenges or more opportunities? And we will start from Andri and finish with Olena. Andri, challenges or opportunities? One word. Opportunities. For me, it's always opportunities. Thank you. Uh, Nadia. Not one word. It is impossible to call this opportunities. I'm sorry. It challenges which we should to turn to the opportunity for sure. Thank you. Let's let's try one word. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good one, Nadia. Uh, but yeah, I would uh, maybe sticking to the rules of the game. I would call it opportunities and saying so. Yeah, after after the night, the day comes. So after the rain, the sun shines. So. Yeah, of course it's a challenge, but uh, we do believe and hence we are standing here. So it's a time of bravery, but it's a time also to put the things, that the thoughts together, like to make uh, the efforts and to make it happen. So thank you. still with opportunity. Thank you. Olena? Um, I think we have no other choice uh, than to stay optimistic, to keep sane. So opportunities. Thank you. So you have four opportunities which means that despite that Ukraine turned from the country who had surplus of generation and now has lack of generation, you still have uh, people who are ready to invest their energy, their efforts, their life to actually use uh, all these challenges, uh, transform all these challenges in opportunities. And those people are also sitting here. I would ask you to give the round of applause to those who are trying to rebuild the energy sector of Ukraine. Thank you. And thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for, contribu for your contribution to all this discussion. Thank you very much for all your support. And uh, let's uh, try to rebuild our country together. Thank you very much and looking forward to the URC tomorrow. <laughs>